Hello everyone, how are you? Welcome back to Marla Speaks. I'm Marla Fernandez Benavides, and today I'm going to delve into a fascinating and often debated topic, spiritual warfare. Now mind you, I'm not a theologian, I'm not learned in religious life. But it's important enough because America is a unique country. And I'll tell you why as we delve into this topic. Specifically, we'll be exploring the clash between traditionalism and humanism in the realm of spirituality. So grab your cup of tea or your cup of coffee, get comfortable, and let's dive in. I have a couple, this is my little corner of the world. My, my son has the whole entire house for himself. So this little corner is where I keep the books that I'm reading. And yes, I, I read a lot and my desk is always messy with books um, because I'm constantly delving between and weaving, ebbing and flowing between different books. Um, and I think it's a gift that God has given me, the gift of natural intelligence. And it's taken me a while to develop this gift. So I have a couple books. I have this book, The Second Mayflower by Kevin Swanson. And I have this book that I'm reading right now. It's called The Spiritual Life and Prayer According to Scripture and Monastic Tradition by Cecile Bouillet OSP. Um, I, I read a lot. I like it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's first define spiritual war warfare. Um, first things first. What exactly is spiritual warfare? Now, in my limited knowledge of <laughs> this topic, it's a term that often is used to describe the cosmic battle, and not really cosmic, but the mystic battle between good and evil, light and darkness within the spiritual realm. Some view it through the lens of religious tradition, which is the proper lens to view it, while others who are like atheistic approach it from a more humanistic perspective. So let's explore the two contrasting viewpoints. Tradition in spiritual warfare. T tradition plays a significant war, war, um, role in spiritual warfare. And by tradition, I mean the Catholic Church. The Church, the Church, um, the early Church is the middle ground for tradition notwithstanding the reformation it's deeply rooted in religious practices rituals and doctrines passed down through generations from the church okay the catholic church well these traditions often provide a framework for understanding the spiritual realm, offering guidance on how to combat negative forces. But tradition always is the key to victory. Or are there alternative perspectives? So let's explore this real quickly. Um, I'm writing a book. And my next book is going to be on conflict resolution and mediation from the perspective of a paralegal. The phone is ringing and I'm just going to let it ring because I really want to get into this. Um, but I'm so glad that my phone is actually working. <laughs> it, it seems to not want to work. So um, if you're listening, Excel, can you please fix your problems and stop 
hindering my landline because I, I really like my landline you know I'm not always on cell phone um, but anyways um, so where was I I was in the tradition and so I believe God is calling me to strengthen my faith and to become more spiritual for a reason I don't know what that reason is gonna be yet hopefully it's to run against Meg Crowley <laughs> um, because you know I really want to debate with her um, but anyways he is making way for me and preparing me for this spiritual voyage um, and which leads me to uh, a quote by Benjamin Franklin. I read Benjamin Franklin and as a female I have to say that he writes for males and he um, tries to he tries to impart words of wisdom so that men can be men and in a world where men are lacking I think that every male should read Benjamin Franklin's handbook um, his autobiography so he says, and I quote, whoever will introduce into public affairs the principles of Christianity will change the face of the world. Benjamin Franklin said that. Yes, Benjamin Franklin was a very spiritual man. And we don't, we're lacking that. We're lacking courage. So, In the Declaration of Independence, a lot of religious principles are embedded in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. And the purpose of government has to do with Christianity. So nobody will ever change anywhere in life unless they have first unless they first have a vision for something better than what we already have. And that's where I'm here. God makes me a visionary. And he, he, my greatest gift is the gift of gab. Yeah, <laughs> that's why my YouTube channel is Marla Speaks, because I have a gift for just talking. Isn't that great? And I bring in people into my discussion. So, you know, I'm very inclusive that way. So, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> so, those who are content to live in a world where most children are born without fathers. Yes, because today, when this book was written, it was only 37%. Um, I think it's 50% now. Um, or between somewhere in between 37% and 50%. I I, I don't really, I don't have the actual statistics in front of me, so I'm not set on that statistics. You're going to have to look it up. But if you're content on living in a world where most children are born without fathers, where 95% of people confess to premarital sex, half of marriages end in divorce. And most of those marriages are religious people that end in divorce and where almost half of the people's income is taxed will have no particular interest in change. So if you don't really, if that doesn't bother you, then just go move along and watch some other YouTube video. Because if you don't have a vision then you will perish and that is in proverbs 29 18. okay so first we need clarity of vision where is america going where are we going where are we going where are we heading biden says he has a vision for a better future he says that we're going to be united okay he says that you're going to he, he, he reiterates the World Economics Forum's vision that you're going to own nothing and be happy. 
Is that the vision that you want? Lacking ownership? You know, the vision of America back when Benjamin Franklin was around was for property ownership. Everybody has a right to property ownership and those who have property rights, those who own property have a right, a full right into debating and um, lobbying their representatives. So what is your vision? What is our vision in America? You know, let's bring that back into the open. But even where a vision is present, the movement it represents will die unless the vision progressively sharpens in its clarity and purpose. What's our purpose in America? Our purpose is freedom, okay? And in America, government is at the bottom of the pyramid. Got it? God is at the top of the pyramid. Why is God at the top of the pyramid? So regardless of whether you believe in God or not, you have to believe that God controls America. And he does. Government doesn't control America. They can't even control themselves. <laughs> That's so silly. Okay, if God controls America, then we have the ultimate control in America to run our lives. Okay, and with that control, we have an obligation to live our life with the highest morals and be highly literate. And with that, we get to run the government ourselves through our representatives. So individual rights is the vision in America, not collective rights. The collective have no right. The pluralist view is really limited. The individualistic viewpoint is absolute. So we as individuals are absolutely free to live our life according to how we believe. And so whether you believe with God or with something else, the spirit of error, you have every right to believe this. And in the end, it will be God who will judge you. So the vision must either sharpen or it will die. So let's try to sharpen this vision. There is no middle ground if we can't sharpen this vision. So we have a window of opportunity, a very small window, okay, right currently, to correct this in America. We can bring about change in America, political change on a political level. And it behooves most Christians to know how to change this. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Most Christians do not know where to start. And their efforts would turn out to be irrelevant or even counterproductive. And I believe that God is calling me to lead the way with humility. And I hope I could do this and unite us Christians so that we could change things politically in Colorado because we still have good Christians and good people who are smart and literate and not stupid. So some Christians wander about in ethical rel relativism not knowing what would constitute just punishment for child abuse or murder. And sometimes Christians will take 
a determined stand on one isolated issue like abortion. For, but their worldview lacks coherence because it lacks comprehensive and for full orbited view of history. Politics, anthropology, epistemology, sociology, economics, ecclesiology, and medicine. So we have a lot of ignorance in many areas because of what we're talking about today. We've lost our way in America and we need to bring it back. How are we going to do this? Well, first, you got to humbly admit that you are flawed. And second, you have to humbly admit that your knowledge is has holes. So for lack of vision, Christian activism is saddled with both lack of unity and direction. And so we need that direction and we need the Catholic Church to stand up and provide that direction because they are the true one church of Christ. So in America, I am calling on my church to stand up and rise. We need the church to unite us Christians. Now, I wanted to say 1 Corinthians 3, 11, 15. And I'm going to quote. As the years pass and the fire burns, it becomes clear that all the energy and effort produced far more wood, hay, and stubble than gold, silver, and precious stones. As long as the agenda is more framed by practical, by political pragmatism and utilitarianism than by the heart commitment to God's law, we will continue to fight losing battles. So as part of my campaign, I'm not gonna fight a losing battle. <clears throat> so if I get nominated by God's grace and I get to run for office against Meg Froelich or whoever. I don't know what God is calling me. I'm praying. I'm not going to fight a losing battle. I'm going to fight God's battle. And I'm going to try to unite us Christians. Thus, in preparation for this voyage of similar scope and impact, I am calling on a second Mayflower. We cannot be content with a small silver of a vision. We need a big vision. If our movement fails to progress, it will be from lack of purposeful vision. And it takes years to clarify a vision. Ask Donald Trump. <laughs> right? Once we have identified this vision, it must be incarnated piece by piece into how we live. So in this second Mayflower, it's going to take shape as we self-consciously live out the principles of God's law in our families, our businesses, and our churches. With Proverbs 29, 18, without a vision, the people perish. But he who keeps the law, happy is he. We need to keep the law. What is the law? Do you even know what the law is? That's where the Catholic Church needs to step in here in America. Because I don't know what the Pope is doing. <laughs> but I'm going to let him 
God knows what he's doing. <laughs> okay, so. So we need to first adopt a cross-disciplined world in life view. Yeah, and we all, all Christians, have to carry our cross. Some of us have a heavier cross than others. Believe you me, I have a heavy cross. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> poof, poof. And this cross must cross over from general epistemology to metaphysical, to ethical governing principles of social relationships, academics, and economics. Only after that will the movement, our movement, our Christian movement, bring any lasting effect to the political sphere. You got to understand this. You got to understand the interconnectivity of family relationships and church relationships with the economic, the academic, and the political spheres. You need to get back in there and start debating these issues. You cannot avoid the political. You cannot avoid the, reli the religion, the religious views. You need to debate it. And in America, we are free to speak. Take up that freedom if you are truly American and your parents consented to be American when you were born. Because in America, if your parents did not consent to be American and they lived illegally while you were born here, you have limited jurisdiction. You cannot run for office. Yes, Kamala, you're wrong. Your parents never naturalized when before you were born. So you did not consent to American law. You are limited. And as that limited, you don't inherit the second highest office. You don't inherit the right to run for office, Kamala Harris. I'm sorry. You have too many foreign influences. You've got a Jamaican influence and an Indian influence. And that is why you're not eligible to run for office. You could be American, yeah, and partake, but you can't run for office, the highest office. Your parents, you need to consent to our law and extinguish all other citizenships. It would be very impossible to change the family in any meaningful way while at the same time leaving present economic and academic systems untouched. So I call every polit politician to change our education system and our economic system in a way that's fruitful for Americans, not the world. Our money must stay with each individual American and you must protect each individual American and their right to property. Okay, so here is the basic core of vision. America is God-centered, okay? You got to understand this reality of metaphysics that our ethical, moral grounding in America is God-centered and when you make laws and you get elected and nominated to represent 
the individuals in your district. You must infuse every law from a biblical perspective. That's what the vision of our founding fathers was back in 1776. Our perspective of God and his connection with us must be in every single law that is written. And I argue that every single law being written today in Colorado does not have this God-centeredness. And we are failing in the vision of our founding fathers. Modern man meticulously removed every remnant of God from the reality and the thinking of, mo of modern man by, introduce by introducing or introduction of purely natural mechanisms in origins via scientific theories. The modern man has denied God's provincial guidance in all things and called into question his omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotency. Omnipotence. Omnipotence. I'm trying to enunciate you. I'm so sorry. That's part of Marlaism. I'm trying to enunciate and I'm just trying to omnipotence. 